Hello and welcome to the Online Wine Tasting Club. Tonight, Kareem complains about living a high life. We live like rich people, but, but, but we work uh, very hard and we never had money at, at the bank. We talk about Godzilla? Godzilla is still alive. And Martin gets very excited about a hole. It's time to dive deeper into wine with the adventurous series High Altitude Wines of Argentina. Good evening, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to you on a slightly chillier night, isn't it now? But um, A little cooler. A little, little cooler. cooler. Um, it's coincidentally quite cool at the top of the Andes Mountains, which is where we are going tonight on the first ever episode of our Adventurous series, which we're really excited about. In fact, we were so excited we were still making videos about three o'clock this morning. Fantastic. We wanted to get plenty of great content. Well, Absolutely. Alex did. He's a <laughs> winemaker, video editor, and all great things like that. Um, but no, we've got lots of fun stuff today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Argentina, about high altitude, about low altitude, about lots of holes. Um, so, as always, there's the chat. What, what else is going on with us today? I don't know. Oh, there we are. <laughs> there we are. There we're at. So, you know, as usual, we'll have our, our quiz questions. We'll have, we've, we've got our Q&A. We've got our chat. Yep. Um, as I said, Alex will do a little... Uh, little bit of wine making shenanigans we'll have the wine news but we're doing lots of talking we're doing so lots of talking i, I think, think the best thing about this wine is... tasting is tasting wine so, so let's uh do take the opportunity um to pop open wine number one um i hope it's all nice and cold for you and um yeah we're very much looking forward to this so this tell us about this wine so we're starting off with our a little bit of whites we're going to be going to piatelli vineyard which is in the cafayate valley which is in the very very northern regions of Argentina, very, very high. But before we get too deep and meaningful, it's probably a good idea just to introduce Argentina. So we can do that with a video. Let's go. Argentina is the world's fifth largest producer of wine. And while there were native grapes growing long before the Spanish colonists arrived in 1502, it was they who brought more well-known European vines with them and started the winemaking industry. Pedro de Mendoza formed one of the first settlements near Buenos Aires, but the famous wine region that shares his name is about a thousand kilometers away from there, high up in the Andes. And Argentina is defined by the Andes, the tallest mountains in the Americas. They make what's called a rain shadow. As the cold, wet air comes in from the Pacific, it rises over the mountains, drops its rain on the western side, so there's nothing left to fall on the east, making a desert. So vines have to cope with barely no water. And not only this, they have freezing cold nights, barren soils, and high levels of ultraviolet light. But it turns out that the best grapes are stressed grapes. The Spanish found the foothills of the Andes were simply brilliant for making wine. Many of the usual problems that growers face are nowhere to be found. There's barely any botrytis or mildew that rot the grapes, with high winds keeping everything well ventilated. There are a few bugs like phylloxera that particularly enjoy this height either. So huge acres of the land were planted with grapes of all different types, and boy did they grow. Perhaps the biggest challenge was that with hardly any rainfall, irrigation was needed. Luckily, the glaciers and snow caps provide reliable crystal clear meltwater that brings down stones and gravels from the mountain, which over millennia have been deposited in the soil. Traditionally, water just was allowed to flow in between the vines. And while there is not much rain, one thing that is dropping from the sky, which keeps Argentinian growers awake at night, is hail. This isn't just loud noises on windows. They do things big over here. We're talking hailstones this big. And the damage it can do is pretty hard to fathom. If that's what it can do to a car, imagine what it can do to a plant full of delicate fruit. The only answer is to protect the vines with nets, which is pretty hard work. And then there's El Nino that messes things around every few years, 
bringing unexpected weather and occasionally ruining entire vintages. But people kept planting and eventually went higher and higher up into the mountains. The highest vineyard is planted at 3,000 metres, that's nearly 10,000 feet high. Workers struggle for lack of breath at these heights. But the way they found the grapes responded was pretty crazy. The ultraviolet light had a huge effect, the grapes had to toughen up, and just as our skin develops melatonin to protect itself when we spend time in the sun, the grapes develop darker, thicker skins, with high levels of the group of chemicals that give flavour and colour to the wine, phenols. This was to turn out to be the key to Argentina's signature style of wine, big and bold, fruity and delicious, but with great acidity from the cool nights and a real mineral connection to the difficult soils they grow in, and that's a pretty good recipe for a cracking glass of red wine. Argentina has a tumultuous history. After years as a colony, it declared independence in the early 1800s, but suffered years of uncertain politics. On the wine side, immigrants flooded in, bringing knowledge, new varieties of vines to plant and food. Winemaking grew to be a huge part of the economy and culture. In the 1980s, the government created incentives to plant in the hotter East Mendoza region. But they put in poor quality, high yielding Criolla grapes. And as the volume went up, the quality and reputation plummeted. By the mid 1990s, the Uco Valley was in decline. Production had dropped two thirds and they were pulling up Malbec and planting tomatoes. 80% of the vines in La Consulta had gone in just 10 years. Was Argentina destined to be a bulk wine country, filling the bottom shelves of our supermarkets? Something had to change. Over in Chile, winemakers had been working with American wine producers to improve their wines, and the results had been astonishing. As far back as the late 1980s, some Argentinian producers had realised the error of their ways. They started to use flying winemaker consultants from France and Italy, and then they brought out the science and started to test what exactly grew well. They also decided to be nice and listen to what people actually wanted to drink. It worked. In just 20 years, the reputation had turned around. The Uco Valley has been described as the new Napa Valley, with the era under vine increasing massively and tourists flooding into the area. Vast, impressive wineries like Zuccardi, ranked as the best in the world several years running, and hotel and spa complexes like The Vines have been popping up. The latter even allows you to buy a few acres of your own vineyard, get involved and make your own wine. Stretching more than 2,000 miles, Argentina is split into three wine regions, the north, Cuyo in the middle, and Patagonia Atlantic in the south. We're going to Salta, right up in the north. A 17 and a half hour drive away from Mendoza on some pretty spicy roads. This is going to be something a little bit different. The Piatelli vineyards are more than 1,600 metres high. Now we've all made some impulse purchases on holidays. My father came home from Australia with a quite disgusting Aboriginal painting. But John Malinsky, a photocopier salesman from Minnesota, came back with a winery. He describes this as a leap of blind faith. But his attention to detail has driven the winery to become incredibly successful. And we tonight are tasting his Torontes. Jamie sat down for a chat with Alejandro, the winemaker at the Cafeete Valley Winery. We have 150 hectares and the vineyards are at between 1,600 meters of elevation to 1,800 meters of elevation. That is very high. And obviously we have an effect of a, a thermal difference of temperature between the day and the night. The days are warm or hot and the nights are very cold, like quite cold. The, the average uh, difference between the day and the night is around 15 to 20 uh, degrees Celsius degree. Wow. Variety that we, wine that we grow. It's the most simple and the most interesting varietal that we have. Every year we are uh, changing small things in the winemaking. 
We are improving the acidity by harvesting early, and also we are improving the, the aromatic profile. We're starting to discover some uh, theos, some citric aromas, like the grapefruit, and more, it's starting to become a little bit more like a, a Sauvignon Blanc. Plus the, uh, th the terpenes, which are the, the aromas of the Muscat. Mm? The Torrontes variety is related to the Muscat de Alejandria, mm? which okay. is one of, the, one of the fathers of the variety. The, it's a crossover between the Mission grape and the Muscat de Alejandria. Mm. Oh, fantastic. fantastic. That's the origin of the Torrontes. And is, is Toronto really only found in Argentina or is there anywhere else in the world that's growing? No, no, no. It's only in Argentina. Only Argentina. Toronto is the only white uh, variety and it's the only original varietal, uh, variety from Argentina. The, oh. the mission grape, the mission grape came with the Spanish conquerors 500, six, uh, 500 years ago. And the Muscat de Alejandria came with the immigrants especially with Italian immigrants that came from the north of Italy. They carry, they, they brought these uh, stocks uh, with them. Um, it, there, there was a crossover in the, in the, in the nature. It was a, a spontaneous crossover. And that's how uh, the farmers uh, discovered this variety, the Torrontes. And there is Torrontes in all of Argentina, in Mendoza, in San Juan, in La Rioja, and but the, the most special is the one that it grows in, in the in the high altitude vineyards in Cafeteria. And, and is the that Torrentes because you, know, the you, need to, you need to keep the acidity high in it to keep that freshness and high altitude helps that, Jess? With the cool nights you preserve the acidity. You, the acidity in our Torontes is fantastic. It's bright, it's not tart, uh, it's not aggressive, and, it's, and it gives a, a lot of elegance to the, to the, to the wine. Fantastic. Um, and I was saying at the beginning, we don't use oak, we don't use any barrel aging. It's a very pure, fresh wine. It's like chewing the grapes. Well, thank you for the interview, for the meeting, it was very nice. Uh, Absolutely. And early in the morning and it's Friday, so it's a perfect moment. Nearly the uh, weekend. The week. <laughs> absolute, <laughs> yes. absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for your time. Goodbye. Thank you. Yes, nice to meet soon. you. And welcome back. Um, we've had some comments already coming through that they think it's a really nice, interesting wine. I, I, I've got to say, I, I, I have to agree. I don't, um, I'm perhaps a little bit biased here, but uh, I hadn't had much uh, Torontes at all before I met Jamie and he's been helping educate me and now we can help spread uh, spread the word of this because uh, I think it, the, the closest thing for me is something like a Viognier and yeah it's, it's quite unique to Argentina and particularly to this north corner isn't it on Salta? Yeah absolutely so you know as, as we talk about Argentina Malbec is obviously the king in the reds but when we talk about whites it's it's definitely Torontes it's an indigenous grape and there's not really anywhere else in the world that grows it and especially as well as, you know, Argentina does when you get up into the high altitudes in, um, in the Cafeete Valley, you're at 1600 meters above sea level. And what's wonderful is to, to talk with people like Alejandro and see their passion for growing these other grapes. It's very easy for people to just make Malbec and make this and yeah. it's done and he's making fantastic wines. But I think, yes, it's rich, it's floral, it's, and I completely agree, it's got this almost Viognier-esque mm. thing about it. A bit it. of honey in it as well. But it's, it's a wine that kind of sits by itself. Yeah. Um, and what, what's interesting about this is there's, um, coriander is a love or hate herb. Some people love it, some people, no one's just okay with coriander. <laughs> and there's a, there's a chemical in coriander that some people taste like as a soap um, and go, that's why they hate coriander. Torontes has the same chemical in it. So if you don't love this wine, you may not love coriander. And if you do love it, you're having coriander on all your tacos. That sounds so, good. So uh, that's a little interesting thing about, you know, and it can go into food and wine pairing. This yeah. is obviously a, you know, a slightly richer dish, you know, mm. a, a fish dish with kind of like a butter sauce or kind of like pork and apple and stuff like that, I think would be absolutely fantastic. Um, but no, we hope you enjoyed it. Any comments in the chat, any questions yeah. that you have, please 
throw that in there. If you love it, that's great. If you don't love it, we'll say Alex picked it this week. Um, <laughs> that's fair. And that's we'll fair. go from there. I, th- uh, I think it's also just worth saying that, that um, I, I, I was being slightly flippant about the, the chap who bought and transformed this winery. Obviously, he was there on a, a holiday and just walked into the winery and uh, they, they tell him the story. And he is perhaps a little bit more than just a photocopier salesman. In fact, he actually had his own photocopier sales company and just did the usual sort of things like buying on a whim 500 acre estate in Wyoming and things like this. So he was he's fairly, fairly wealthy. And honestly, I think it's one of the one of the prettiest uh, wineries in, in Argentina. This So but he's got the money to spend on cracking winemakers like Alejandro. So no, absolutely. And, you know, it's it's <clears throat> what's interesting about um, this. This guy is from, from Minnesota and he still is involved in the day to day running of the winery from yeah. afar. It's not he's just bought this ranch and hey, make some wine for me. He still is involved with it like on a on a day to day basis, yeah. which is great. But, you know, when you have that bit he of describes money, describes himself as a bit of a micromanager. And I think that's actually quite a good habit in a winemaker because, yeah, you can't just sort of just leave it and hope for the best, really. So, no, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, Lovely. This is, um, what I think we should do okay. is we're going to do a little bit of wine news next. But mm-hmm. if you've finished your Torontes, Dive in, get wine number two in the glass. Um, if you haven't finished your Torontos, feel free. But what we're going to do, we're going to do a little bit of wine news and then we're going to uh, see another winemaker with wine number two, see what he's all about. So it's just going to kind of flow into that. Yeah, is what that I seems think. pretty so, good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the wine news this week, we've we've just got a couple of things to talk about. It won't be too long, but um, the, the first thing to mention is um, uh, both Jamie and I are huge, huge fans of the Napa Valley, and they've been having a torrid time of it over the last few years. But this year has just been utterly disastrous for a lot of you know, incredible wineries and vineyards out there. No, absolutely. I'm, I'm sure because it it's more than just the wine news. It's, it's been all over you know, yeah. every news, everywhere, and it's the, the, the glass fire that's been running through Napa Valley. And on top of the glass fire, if you look at there's been about 25 major fires through the wine-growing regions of California. Um, but I think the glass fire is the one that kind of hit the news because of, you know, the prestigious wineries and uh, Meadowood Ranch, which was a three Michelin star restaurant, has yeah. uh, just disappeared. And it's not just that these buildings are gone and these vines are gone. It's it's people's livelihoods. It's people's families. It's people's entire career have disappeared. And it's also <laughs> the history that, you know, you take these wineries and they've got, you know, their wines from the 60s and 70s when they first started destroyed all yeah. gone nothing left and you you can't recreate that um and there's been some very big names affected uh toffinelli chateau boswell you know the you know loads of money really mass things but there's also a lot of vineyard sites that i think people may not have heard of and you'll hear oh this vine- this this winery was unscathed and that was the physical building, the building was unscathed yeah. and their vineyards but in napa what you have and the surrounding areas is you have lots of people who are just growing their grapes and they supply these world-class wineries with their grapes and those have disappeared. And they're not coming back overnight either. You, you, to, to replant a vineyard and then get the quality of grapes you need, you, you, you try to tell the vine to divert its energy into forming really strong roots for the first few years. So you, you cut off any any uh, buds that are flower forming on it and, uh, and you make sure there are no grapes that are taking energy away from getting strong roots in its first few years. So it's three years really Plus. minimum before you get anything off the vine and it'll be a tiny yield in the first first few years absolutely uh, so. and you know and the grapes that weren't picked <clears throat> are done for except yeah. there is there is one little project that i've heard about there's some people out there because the grapes be covered in soot they're going to attempt to make a brandy so they're going to take that smoky flavor and um see if they can get something a little good out of something that is absolutely horrific i think this year we've all been forced to sort of improvise quite a lot i don't think when we decided we were going to start a little winery and uh, uh that we ever thought we were going to be getting into packaging design and uh and live streaming but here we are and it's great that we are so you've got to make the best out of the situations they're given to you but anyway so so you're a winemaker yeah you're a winemaker and um you always yabber on me about pretty rosés in their glass bottles yes. um Jamie, don't put that anywhere near the window because the light strike will ruin it. Indeed. So, so there's, there's something that not a lot of people know about. Right. Rosé makers love to put their rosé wines in clear glass bottles because then you could admire this beautiful salmon pink colour that they've spent 
God knows how long trying to perfect and make it really on trend and everything. But it's um, there's a chemical reaction which happens when that ultraviolet light that's in the sunshine hits some of the flavour compounds in it. And I, you have to be quite a sort of a wine geek to spot it. But actually the flavour it creates is one of the key flavours of cabbage. So if you're desperate to have a cabbage flavoured wine, then leave your rosé on the windowsill in the sunshine. So somebody in Slovenia, and I, I will probably have to look up his name because I'm going to struggle to pronounce it, but he has come up with uh, this, the answer for this. And this is called, I think, is it right? Never touched by light. Never touched by light. And wine made 100%. In the dark. In the dark. Yeah. So, which is a slightly strange concept because presumably the grapes had to get a bit of sunshine on them to happen it. But they were harvested in the dark using night vision goggles. They were vinified in pitch black conditions in the winery and it shipped to you in a black bottle held inside a black bag. And their tasting tips for this are you should only drink it from a black glass in a dark room. But they do have a little thing in parentheses that. This may not always, may be, not possible. always be possible. Yeah. We were going to trial it, but we thought, uh, you know, with our with our technological skills and our microphones and our laptops, maybe not the best idea this Perhaps. evening. So, uh, but keep but, an eye out for a never touch by light. So, uh, and it's quite a cool way of actually getting people aware of the problem of just treating their wine, their rosés, with a little bit more care. So, if you've got a rosé that comes in a box, keep it in that box until you need it, and then there'll be less chance of it tasting like cabbages. Fantastic. There we are. <laughs> Top tip. Top tip. Top tip. No cabbage rosé. So um, a lot of winemakers, uh, we're now going to start to move on to another video and um, talk to a winemaker who is perhaps a little bit different from most. Um, when I talk to winemakers, they tend to geek on at me about um, different yeah. yeast strains yeah. that they think are particularly interesting or what yeah. temperature they used on this ferment or what combination of clone and rootstock which are different bits of the vine sorry when you talk to other wine when makers, i talk to yeah i'm i am you talk totally to guilty yes. totally guilty but um we did an interview with a, a winemaker a couple of weeks ago down in uh, kent and i just chatted to him for three hours and no usable footage whatsoever but the winemaker we're going to meet next isn't like that he's not if you <laughs> want to play winemaker and be a little bit of a rock star the guy you want to aspire to be like is carrie mussy Every bottle of wine is a reflect of the person that made it. Open your heart, open your soul, open your mind, and express that beautiness, that inside beauty, through a glass of wine. We know how many risks we have in, in this uh, business, when they like the wines, you say, oh, phew. Knowing how many things can go wrong and somebody take it, I don't know, 10,000 kilometers away from here and they enjoy it, it's a very beautiful experience because it's a success of all these million of details that we have to consider to put the right bottle on the right hand. Part of the day we are farmers, uh, we have to deal with the weather. In the same day you have to be a winemaker and at the end of the day you have to get a jacket and uh, have a dinner with your customers to sell wine. The harvests are very stressful. Uh, when I started by myself, it was even worse. So every year it improves a little bit in terms of comfort. I have more people, more infrastructure, uh, and more experience. It's a kind of celebration, but you are so tired that you cannot even celebrate. You just want to close the winery and get out of there. Two things that are very important. The vineyard or the grapevine and the barrels. These two things are silent machines that work 24-7 and are the two most important things to make a great bottle of wine. Being a winemaker, you have access to many beautiful things that other people have to be a millionaire to get it. 
I can drink the best wines in the world, I can eat the best food in the world, I can meet great people around the world, uh, not paying anything. until the last uh, second of my life. My name is Karim Musi Safi. I'm a winemaker. Everybody call me as uh, El Turco. It's quite a fun video. I, 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 the, the guy is, is, is really cool and he's done some, done some good things for us, but um, I, 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 it doesn't actually go into much of the detail about the, quite the range of different things that he does. I mean, do you want to tell people a little bit more about about him and his wineries? Yeah, absolutely. So, so Karim is absolutely fantastic, fantastic. Um, and we were really excited when we first got into to events in this project that um, Karim was coming from Argentina. Um, he was going to Germany, but he was going to stop off in the UK and um, and do a tasting with us. And it was going to be like our inaugural tasting. Um, and he just makes. Phenomenal wines. He makes lots of different tiers, lots of different styles. <clears throat> lots of different labels. Lots of different <laughs> labels, um, but does some interesting things. So this, this Semyon is from his Poetas range, which mm -hmm. I hate using the term because it's not an entry level wine, but this is his entry level thing. And this is the level that's based on wine being about art and not about science. Don't say that too loud to the winemaker. <laughs> um, but about art and the work he's done in the vineyard. And if you look at the label, it's got Edgar Allan Poe and William Shakespeare on it. And those are the people that he kind of takes his inspiration yeah. from to, to make these wines. Oh, so, I, think, I think it's a really interesting question that we, you know, we, we like to ask winemakers is, are you more on the science side or more on the arts side? And Argentina, from, from the research I've been doing for this tasting, seems to have gone really quite deep down the science route, as you'll see with the next set of wines. But, but, but Karim, he is first and foremost an artist, so he uses his tastes and he's particularly good at blending, isn't he? Absolutely. So in this Poeta's range, he makes a um, he makes his Libertad blend, which is it's tempranillo based, um, but there's no oak on it, so the um, the grapes really shine through. So it's bright, it's fresh, it's delicious. So tempranillo and Malbec in there. You then go up to his into his Alto Cedro, which is his Año Zero range. It's called Año Cedro because the first year he made it was two thousand, and he yeah. does a a hundred cent tempranillo in there done in. American oak, so it's almost like an Argentinian Rioja. Mm. Um, he does other Malbecs, bits and pieces, but then he has what is, I think, his coolest project, which is his uh, Alandes project, yeah. which is his, and that's short for All Andes. So it's a multi great, multi vintage, <laughs> multi style, multi this blend. So every year he yeah. picks his wines, he Absolutely picks brilliant. his grapes, he makes his wines, he keeps some reserve wine back. And then it's a blend of different grapes from different years together to make, in the reds, a Bordeaux-style blend with Cab and Malbec and uh, Merlot. Well, it's like, it's like I mean, for me, it's, it's such a... People, people love to associate wine with a vintage, with a particular year. Um, and yet, actually, if you've got all of these wines ageing in barrels in your winery, some from last year, some from four years ago, some from potentially longer... And it'd be like to, to, to create a blend where you're not using all the wines that are available to you. It's a bit like an artist only using the paint that the, the, the salesman had in stock that year. Right, this, this season, I'm going to be doing a blue painting because blue is the colour this year. Well, you know, if you've got all the other colours, and that's what, that's what the component wines are in a blend. But I think it's also worth saying that Semillon here, obviously it's a single grape wine. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean, does it, that it's just all the grapes have come in and gone into a big tank and there's the wine. There's still blending to be done. There's still blending to be done because you'll pick different things at slightly different times mm -hmm. and bring them in and you'll take that and that and that's what will come into the final blend. Sometimes as a, as a, a more premium winemaker, if you get certain stuff that isn't up to scratch for your wine, mm -hmm. that may well move into you know one of the more bulk wines and gets blended yeah. into something else and it changes. So, you know, there's there's... Not always good grapes and bad grapes, but there's different uses for different grapes. You take a champagne house, a certain set will go into the vintage prestige yeah. cuvee, 
and then other <laughs> stuff just goes into their house, multi-vintage, whatever yeah. it is. I'm Listen, I, I think, think really we've taught, we've talked because the problem is that we we can both talk about Kareem for, and and his wines for a long time because we're quite big fans. But but I think it's important for us to to get on to a bit more of the crux of the evening, and we can't do that without first giving something away because oh. Jamie's been chomping at the bit to tell you about Godzilla. So, well, be before we mention Godzilla, we've yeah. not talked enough about altitude. And this is really important because we're going back to the Piatelli wines um, very, very quickly because we didn't talk about the other things they do. They make a Tanat, which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. 2,600 bottles made for the UK market only. That's yeah. it. They make some high altitude um, uh, Malbecs. They also have a little bit down in Mendoza as well and keep separate. But what's important is the altitude. It's about... 1650 meters above sea level mm -hmm. which is a mile it is so it is one mile above the ocean they have a wine club there so if you join the piatelli wine club do you know what it's, it's called not, is it it is it's called the piatelli wine club <laughs> that that wasn't what i was expecting you to say there um I've well well we'll stop there and we'll, we'll go into yeah, giveaways let's, let's but anyway we, but, we, so what we're giving away today what are we giving away today i think we should give away a chance for someone to invite a friend to join them on a tasting I of their that choice. So great. Send one you, to your mum. If, to... if you've loved what we've done today, send it to someone and get them in on a tasting with you. If you've hated it, send it to someone you don't like. That's fair. Happy days. <laughs> we can do that. Fantastic. And just let us know. Um, but so what we're going to do is we're, we're talking about altitude and high altitude and everything in Argentina is really high altitude because anything above 500 metres is classed as a high altitude wine and Mendoza starts there. Um, and people, you know, sometimes you go, oh, that's measured in, in feet, that this is 300 feet high or 10,000 feet high. You know, we talked about the, the mountains earlier. Oh, it's 300 metres or 10,000 feet. And we, we've got to do all this mad kind of, what is it? Are we inches, metres, miles, feet, hands of horses? Who cares? So I thought, and I did a nice little graph that no one liked my technological <laughs> skill. So you don't get to see that. We might put it in the outtakes because yeah, I might. think it's cool. Um, <laughs> But I've decided we're going to measure altitude in Godzilla's. So the question is, the question is, <laughs> the Cafeete Valley, the highest point, and there's been many Godzillas in its time. Mm -hmm. So we're taking the average height of a Godzilla in the 90s because Godzilla has range. He seems to grow every movie, and I don't want any Godzilla fans to yeah, come we, back we and say, "Yeah, we aren't compensating for I've, Godzilla I've inflation." Picked, I picked here. the I picked the wrong Godzilla. But how many Godzillas high is? The Cafeete Valley. There we go. You should, if the world's a good place, have a multiple choice. I made it easy for everyone. There's yeah. multiple choice because I'm friendly <laughs> like that. So uh, get your answers in and we'll see where we're at. We'll see where we're at. Yeah, Fantastic. Absolutely. So um, I think it's... Uh, oh, what were we about to do next? We, we... I was going to talk a little bit about the Uco Valley. I think that's an excellent idea because, so, because Uco Valley is, is, is a really cool place. But I said in the video... Lots of people are referring to it as the new Napa Valley. And my God, I, I, if I'd just sat there putting in all the pretty buildings that have gone up for this Argentinian wine trail, um, I could have just made that video about an hour long. It's, it's a really awesome place. And it's not actually as cheap as you'd expect, is it? Because like we were looking at one of the, the, the vines, the resort spa, and that was about a sort of $1,000 a night to stay there. Which so is who's coming with premium. us to film one? So, we can travel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. I, th I think we've got to get out there. Caroline's put her hands up. A wise move. A but, wise um, move. A wise move. Yeah, um, well, what's, what is it about it that makes it so good? Is it, is, it, is it just a combination of things or is it this fundamentally this altitude? And... So there's, there's lots of things and I, I learned a lot. And before we continue, we're going to say, if everyone's got a chance, grab three glasses. Ah, yes. If you want to get them, they're, oh. they're over there. I've got them set for you. You can go and do that and I'll, 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 do, do, that. I'll do the intro. How about that? That sounds good. Um, so if we, if we grab our three glasses, so we can taste them side by side. So <coughs> the wines are all very different. But we go up these different levels. But what I learnt talking to these winemakers was so many different things matter. Yes, altitude changes and things get cooler, warmer, stuff like that. But as you go up in altitude, the soils are different because of the alluvial flow. Um, that changes, that's different. Um, we get, you know, richer wines, more silt, different things. So we got to talk with uh, Martin Kaiser, um, which is really kind of cool because we had this set up and then he got announced as the Viticulturist of the Year. So 
He knows what he's talking about. If we're going to talk to someone about how to grow a bit of grape, yeah. he might be the man. So what we've got, we've got two little videos. So what we're going to do is we're going to dive in, get a bit of an intro to uh, Martin and Donna Paola and what they're doing. And then we're going to come back here after wine number one, have a little talk about it, then go back in and have a bit of a deep dive into wines number two and wine number three. But feel free to get your questions, get your chat in, go from yeah. there and we'll... Um, we'll Head into the video. And we're, at the end of it, we'll be asking you which of these is your favourite. So how high are you? I see what you did there. <laughs> Let's do a video. Uh, Martin, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about Donna Paula and the wines and uh, really, you know, a focus on the, the Altitude series. But to start with, if you could just give us a little bit of background about yourself, how you got into wine and um, what you're doing with Donna Paula at the moment. Well, I, um, I was born in Mendoza, and you know Mendoza is this uh, province of Argentina where 70% um, of the wine industry is concentrated. So uh, in, in Mendoza, it's, it's about 2 million people province. Uh, there is a quite large province, but uh, the city is, is about 50% uh, of the population. Um, and er, near to the city, so if you take your car at one hour drive, you, you can visit almost all the wineries of, of, the, of the province and most of the vineyards are located quite close to the city of Mendoza. So uh, from my family, my grandfather was a viticulturist, uh, my father too, so it's kind of a uh, my legacy to continue working in, in the vineyard. So I study agronomic engineer. Uh, I made a, a, a master degree also in viticulture and enology. And since the beginning of my career, I've been working with vineyards in, uh, since 1999. I think what's really interesting is the, the look that you, you take on the soil structure. Am I right in saying you've got over 700 pits around the wineries kind of looking at the different soil structure and the areas and and what why why is that important um you know as far as you know the soil and the structure and on which grapes grow and and you know why why 700 that seems a huge amount yeah in, in fact now we have done more than 1000 it thinks is that something that continue growing um wow. Well, what, what is something to make it short, uh, uh, as an anecdote, an anecdote um, here in Argentina at the end of the 90s and beginning of 2000, Argentina was making a big shift from producing big volumes of, of bulk wine, uh, bulk, uh, sorry, table wine, yes, because we were, we used to be huge con consumers of table wine. Uh, we started to produce more fine wines, trying to export. But the thing is that the technology and the knowledge that, the, that we had 20, 25 years ago was, uh, was for a different purpose. So a lot, a, many consultants came from different parts of the world just to say, okay, you should start working with uh, stainless steel inox and all this technology, try this, try that. And we learned a lot, but uh, at, um, at one time we said, okay, we have, we're stuck in terms of uh, result. Uh, we start seeing that when you work with different, different blocks inside your, in, it's the same vineyard, sometimes you have, you have different results from different blocks, um, but the results were kind of random somehow. Just for example, I, I remember it was like in 2007, we picked the block number 15 from the vineyard in which uh, I'm now, that is in, in Luján de Cuyo, Ugarteche, Luján de Cuyo. And we made a wine that was, excel all the wineries, all the wines in the winery. And what fun, was fantastic. So next year we tried to mimic the same results 
uh, we didn't have it. And so I started to think about, because we have had, uh, we have harvested one hectare for that tank uh, from a block that has six hectares. So we, I said, okay, maybe we missed the nice pot, the nice uh, block, the nice place inside that block. What, what, what's important about high altitude wines? And then after that, maybe we could kind of talk about each of the wines individually as to, uh, you know, why the blends are different and what's important and what we look at in each uh, in each wine um, as its own component. Yeah, so we have, we can talk about in Mendoza to make it simple, that we have three terraces, three big terraces with different altitudes. So the bigger volume of uh, wine is produced in the lower terraces, that uh, the lower terrace that goes from 600 to 700 meters of elevation. Uh, because it's, uh, lower is, is the warmer and it's a place that is quite quite hot in summer. The second terrace, you go to Luján de Cuyo. Luján de Cuyo is much much smaller region. Is where we produce this wine, the 969. Uh, and that's, that's the altitude, right? The 969 yeah. is the altitude. So, um, the the number relates to the altitude and we relate the altitude with the climate because whenever you go higher, it's colder, of course. You know that higher, high in the, in the mountains, the climate is colder. Yes. Um, that determines huge difference, even in the same variety and if, always talking about Mendoza province, uh, you have huge differences of the style of the wine that you get according to the climate of the place. So just for you to imagine, um, the east of Mendoza is, as I told you, is, is quite hot. It's like uh, Jerez de la Frontera in Spain. Okay. Yes, so it's a place that is dry and warm. If you are going uh, to Luján de Cuyo, it's more similar to um, maybe the south of France. Yes, the languedoc Poussillon in terms of temperature. Okay. And if you go to Uco Valley, it's, it's getting colder, so you start to be closer to, um, I would say, Rioja. Uh, and then if, if you go very high to the Uco Valley, but in the highest part, you, it could be as cold as uh, Val de Loire or Bordeaux or even, even uh, Champagne. Wow, you so go very a, high. A so massive temperature range. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so you can go, you can do a travel in terms of climate uh, from from Jerez de la Frontera to Champagne only driving your car one hour, which is very crazy. The fruit profile of wine coming from different places in Mendoza, you could you could uh, summarize the following place. If you are in, if you are in the lower terrace, from six hundred to seven hundred meters. Uh, that is quite hot. The Malbec there develops um, a lot of red fruit and a spicy notes, so a lot of white pepper. And the mouse is very soft, so very soft and it's very easy to drink wines. When you go to Luján de Cuyo, 1,000 meters of elevation, the Malbec uh, starts to develop more black fruit, more, more floral notes, and the the, it's not so spicy, but it's a little bit more herbal. So you may find some very subtle mean flavors in Luján de Cuyo. If you, st if you continue growing to colder region, you start to get more black fruit, more floral notes, and depending on the type of soil, you will get some, some mineral notes in Uco Valley that are harder to find in Luján de Cuyo. So we planted many varieties in different places, and we started to learn. And then we, we made some mistakes, uh, but we started learning how, how, this, how we could improve this. Um, and also, which is the, the best soil to grow each variety. So you will see in these three blends that each of them has a different composition in the varietals. 
So the 969 is mainly Petit Verdot and Bonarda because we think that that varieties excel in Luján de Cuyo. Malbec does very well in Luján de Cuyo also. It's something we have been producing Malbec in, in our vineyard in Luján de Cuyo for a long time. Um, it performed very well, but we were looking for, for this uh, range of wine. We were looking for a little bit, I would say, more, um, more tense tannins, okay. a, a, little bit, a little bit higher structure in the wine. And also, um, we were looking for complexity uh, in, in terms of flavors. And we found that uh, in Petit Verdot and Bonardo. So Petit Verdot, you know, that is a, it's a variety that has a tendency to have very strong tannins. Uh, but in Luján de Cuyo, as long as it's, it's still warm during the, it's not very hot, but it's still warm during the summer, uh, the tannins here get more ripened and they get kind of silky and uh, has a little bit of rainy um, texture. So we, we blend this Petit Verdot with uh, Bonarda, and Bonarda in Luján de Cuyo, uh, you know, Bonarda has been used for making table wine because in some places it can give huge yields uh, for a decent wine, but uh, if it's planted in very special places, you can, you can have incredible wine. So we have combined these two varieties and it has, depending on the vintage, some year we have uh, blended with a little bit of Tanat. And in the last two years we have blended with a little bit of Malbec, but only uh, in less 10% or a little bit less. Um, what you get in this wine is, is a full, it's a, it's a fully fruity expression of, of this place and that's what we love. So, welcome back. Welcome back. Um, I have to apologize to my, my friend Alex here. I got very excited about Mendoza. I got very excited about the Uco Valley. I got very excited about red wine and I got less excited about his winemaking. There's a load of great comments come through. So I am going to get with Caroline and sort out the questions, but um, have you got anything you wanna? Yeah, I thought, I thought it'd be quite good. So the, the, the whole point of the adventure series is that we go a little bit deeper into, into wine. And um, we give you a sort of behind the scenes look at, at, at some of the things that are going on in the vineyards, in the winery. And we've just finished um, uh, harvest time here for most of the, most of the wineries in, in England. And especially our winery. Especially our winery. Well, uh, yeah, we've been a little bit busy with a few other things, but um, um, yeah. So we we we've done some winemaking. We'll show you some pictures of, of that at the end of it. Um, and we thought that that perhaps the thing that was of most interest to like how 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 does the, the decisions that you make affect the wine? Um, and the the top one is when do you harvest? Because if you harvest two weeks uh, before a certain date. You might, you're, you're basically what will good happen acidity. is you'll, you'll get good acidity, <laughs> but you won't get. Uh, so there's a, there's a, I'll, and be, I'll show you a graph of this, but I'll tell you a bit about how we make those decisions and the three tests that we put the grapes through. Um, and what I might go and do while that is, is get one of the little cunning, cunning meters that we've got to show you. But um, yeah, let's have a little story about three minutes about winemaking. Go. So most people in England have just about finished their harvests and I thought I'd take the opportunity to talk you through the decision point of when to harvest the grapes. So winemakers use three chemical tests. They take a range of berries from all over the vineyard so that it's actually representative of what you've got. And you take that juice and do three simple tests on it. The first is sugar. In the vineyard you can use this tool which looks a little bit like a telescope. You put a drop of the juice onto the end of that, close the lid and point it at a light. When you look through the end of it, there's a line which shows you what your sugar level is. And that's normally measured in a variety of different things. We'll just use one, bricks. And if your juice is at 20 bricks, that means that the wine has a potential alcohol. That means if you ferment it fully dry all the way, you'll end up with an 11.5% alcohol wine. If it's at 25 bricks, you could make a 15% alcohol wine. However, of course, you can stop the fermentation halfway through or part the way through. Then you'll end up with a lower alcohol but sweeter wine. Next up, it's acidity. 
You may remember pH from school and little coloured strips that would change and tell you whether it was acid or alkaline. Most people these days use a digital meter, which has to be calibrated, but they're pretty easy. The lower the pH, the more acidic it is, the higher, the less acidic. Wines usually find themselves around about pH 3. The lower the pH, the harsher an environment it is for bacteria and other bugs. So the more stable the wine is, which means you can get away with using less preservatives. Finally, it's acidity. So it turns out that pH doesn't give you the whole picture. The other measure is called TA, titratable acidity, and this tells you how many grams of acidity you have in each litre of wine. Now this is measured by adding an indicator into a carefully measured sample of juice. You then titrate, or very, very slowly drip, an alkaline solution into the juice, one drop at a time. The indicator changes colour when the juice goes from acidic to alkaline. That alkaline cancels out the acid. You then check on your burette, which is this long glass tube, how much it took to neutralise that acid. And why do we do this? Well, it, it turns out that it's this titratable acidity that's what you notice, not the pH. When your tongue picks up acidity, your mouth waters. And that cancels out the solidity to protect your skin. So the higher the TA, the more your mouth waters. Too much, it's like paint stripper. So as we're waiting for harvest, the acidity is dropping over time and the sugar level is rising. If the figures aren't quite right, you have to make the decision whether it's better to wait it out or whether colder, damper weather is going to start your grapes rotting, which will make bad flavours. So that's a really tricky balance and it's important to get right. Welcome back. I hope that was of some interest. Um, yeah, it, you do end up assembling this strange array of, of various different gad gadgets and gizmos, don't you? And um, yeah, this is uh, how you can pretend to be Admiral Nelson looking for your looking for your potential alcohol through that. So you, this is the nice thing about this is it's com it's compact. You can just wander through the vineyard with it. Um, that's uh, your pH meter. This is a slightly more high tech version of the Brick's sugar level monitoring, and that. You literally just pop it in and you press a button and it tells you really precisely. But the, the bit where you really feel like a mad scientist is where you're doing the, the titrations and, and you might remember that back from sort of GCSE chemistry and things like that. But um, yeah, ultimately it gives you this picture of where the grape is and its development cycle and when you're going to pull that trigger. And it, it's it's really difficult. I spoke to some winemakers last year who they, they delayed waiting for the sunshine to ripen the grapes a bit more because they wanted a bit more ripeness and it rained and rained and rained and all that happened was the grapes got bigger and more diluted and uh, then started going mouldy which isn't brilliant not really ideal. So, not ideal so yeah you, it's, they're big decisions to make i'm gonna move that out of the way so yeah are we gonna do a few questions yeah absolutely so um there's a couple of questions about the the semion and yeah. what the altitude does and whether it's oaked and all that kind of stuff so karim was sees Poetis level is all un -oak, so there's no oak in there, but it definitely does have this richness. Yeah. It sits on the leaves, so it gets that little bit of texture, and that's what's giving the richness there rather than actually Jamie being Jamie's used a techie oak. term. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows what lees is, but it's something that's very hard to describe. Get if book, you've got see, your see tasting your book. book, you'll be delighted to know. This is what all of our members uh, at the moment get. You get a nice little key ring, professional sommeliers, uh, uh, sorry, corkscrew and key ring. Key ring. Don't well, do key rings, yeah. We should do that. Um, key ring? This is where you can enter any notes about the wines that you have. And then there's a glossary, which took a bloody age for us to write. There's a, there's a lot of was wine it? words. Yeah. We, we suddenly found ourselves writing a book in the middle of lockdown while waiting for our, our robo Jamie to be built. So Exactly. Yeah. Um, but anyway, back to Semyon. So <laughs> the, it's the, the lees, which is the little yeasty bits that are kind of left yeah. over, will give that texture and that flavour. And then there was a question about how the altitude affects it. So altitude can affect in two ways. It gives you the opportunity, you have the diurnal shift, and I talk about it all the time, but we'll go more into diurnal shift in just a moment. Um, but it means that you have the cool evenings, so you can get great ripeness in fruit, but still keep the acidity that gives you the balance. When you're, so you get that from being cool. When you compare it to France in Bordeaux, you get that coolness because it's just a colder place. Um, so you might find they're both similar in style, but you're getting the, the coolness being able to keep the acidity high in France because it's cool climate and it's the altitude that gives you that coolness in, in Argentina. 
And once again, when you see Semillon in France, generally in Bordeaux, you're generally seeing it as a blend. Yeah, yeah. So it becomes, it's generally a little bit richer, a little bit heavier in style, and they use Sauvignon Blanc to keep the acidity high. They do. This is 100% Semillon, and it's kind of cool, because there's not really huge amounts of 100% Semillons. No. Maybe a little bit in Sauterne, but yeah, maybe dessert, wines, dessert wines. But yeah. And that's where you get, you know, the grape as a characteristic. You have that honeyedness that was really good when you look yeah. at a yeah. dessert wine. Um, Organic wines were mentioned. Mm -hmm. There's more and more people going that way, you know, organic farming, and especially up in the um, up in the mountains, you know, it's it's low intervention anyway. It's difficult to get machinery up there. It's difficult to get a tractor up there to spray mm -hmm. pesticides. So it's you know a lot of it is generally lucky green, as well because sustainable. They don't, they don't have they don't have as many of, of the problems as we said. But but that doesn't mean you don't need to get access up there and. Uh, yeah, and organic, it, I think it's something that people should be aiming for. There are a few little things to avoid in it, but um, yeah, it, it's it's certainly trying to trying to make the message that you take a bit of care of your vineyard and you want it to continue uh, has has huge impacts on the wine. Um, no, completely. And organic is different in different places, mm -hmm. different parts of the world, and it doesn't always make a better wine. It doesn't no. always. It, it, it organic is potentially the right thing to be mm -hmm. aiming towards sustainability, but it can't always be. It can't always be. What's in the glass has to be great, and if it's organic, that's a bonus. And that's yeah. purely my opinion. And it's, it's not very good for the environment to spend all this time and effort and uh, you know, tractor hours growing vines and tending them, and then for your wine to be worthless because it's terrible. So exactly. the, 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 they're all things in life are compromises, and uh, you know, if, you, if it's going to result in you not using a little bit of... Um, a spray to keep off the mold, then your wine will be thrown away, and that that's also bad for the environment. So it's weighing one thing against another. Absolutely. So we we should have had a little sip of wine number yeah. one, if not a large sip of wine number one. And this is a uh, Bernardo and Petit Verdot blend, as you would have seen in the in the video. So this is from the lowest altitude. Um, it's from the Petit Verdot is a little bit lower, and I want to say it's at nine hundred eight meters. And then a Bernardo's a little bit higher, and I'm not going to say what it's at because then the average is 969, <laughs> and I don't want anyone to correct me on my numbers. So you add those two altitudes, and it comes together at 969. And I mentioned a little bit about the diurnal shift, um, but I think probably the best person to tell us about the diurnal shift would be the man who deals with it on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're going to go into wines number, well, two and three of this, but four and five from your pack. Yeah. And we'll... Uh, do, I mean, do we want to talk about, the, there was a question about the, the pouches versus bottles and things like that. Because well, we, we started off using little glass bottles and little, um, little things like that. Um, when we announced our very first online wine tastings, um, which we were only delivering locally at the time, and that was on the, the 16th of March, which is before the country even went into lockdown. So that gives you some idea how long we've been working on trying to get, um, get our new packaging sorted. Um, but... What actually isn't so important, there are, there are a couple of things that are important about it. Um, one is obviously making sure everything's absolutely sterile and perfect like that. And the other is where, how much the wine gets into contact with the air while you're pouring it. And if, when you're just hand pouring bottles, it's fine if you're sending them out the, the next day um, and you're drinking them the day after that. That's absolutely fine, or even sooner. But the whole system that we've been developing is about trying to keep the oxygen in the air away from the wine so that it does not damage the wine and it keeps the, the delicate compounds like the, the, the flavors of the smells like aromatic compounds are, are really fragile and a little bit of contact with oxygen can, can ruin it. So our system is basically protecting it under layers of two different gases at two different stages that don't react with the wine. And so that's what we're spending a lot of time on. It's more about that than it is about the material. This material lets in less air than a cork does. So when it's in the bag, if you've treated it right, it should be good. So what we're doing now is we're doing some longevity trials, and these are packaged up as late as we can get away with it, which gives us great fun with Royal Mail, and they don't turn up <laughs> even to the same town that it was shipped from. So um, thanks, Royal Mail, for, for that. But um, yeah, uh, we'll, be, we'll be doing some longevity trials before we launch things like uh, you know off-the-shelf kits where you can go off and try five Burgundies or try five Riocas and things like that. So, yeah, that'll be the next step. That sounds like a plan. Sounds well, like a plan. Alex will be doing longevity trials yeah. if you need him. With the Fantastic. Lab. I'll be back with more of this again. But anyway, <laughs> we're, we're digressing from the fun stuff because yeah. the fun stuff is the wine. So we... 
let's go back in where we uh, talk about the diurnal shift. When you have, in general, when you have lower urinal swing, the plant, the evolution of the physiology of the plant is, is more, I would say, goes easier. Because when you have cold at night and when you have hot during the day, the plant may be stressed by the cold temperatures in the springtime and the autumn and by the hot temperatures during the summer. So uh, this is stressing condition sometimes delays the phenology of the plant. You, you mentioned the phrase, the, um, right. the diurnal shift, where it's a little bit warmer in the day and then it gets cooler in the night. Um, what, why is that important for grape growing rather than it being always warm or always cool? What, what does that do for the, uh, the grape for the ripening process? Well, in, uh, depending on the conditions, you get different results. So we, we, it's quite curious. So for making these three wines, the, the 969, the 1100, and the 1350, if you look at the figures, the maximum temperature are similar in, uh, in the 969 and 1100. But the colder temperature is, are much lower in the 1100. Okay. And so this possibly. lower temperature, this lower temperature are very similar uh, from the 1100, are very similar to the 1350 minimal temperature. But the high temperature of the 1350, as long as it's higher, they are lower. So in each condition, you get very different results. Uh, in general, when, when the diurnal swing is lower, and that's what we get in the 1350 place, because this, this place is uh, located, uh, this vineyard in Gualtajari. Gualtajari is in Tupongato, and Gualtajari is the highest, re, uh, the highest sub-region of Tupongato. And there, as long as it's very close to the end and it has the biggest low, the diurnal swing temperature is quite low. So it's the lowest of the Uco Valley. We have there 12 degrees on average, while in Los Indios we have 16 degrees on average. So a huge, huge difference. Okay, yes. Well, the 1100, there we are going to South Uco Valley. So, uh, Uco Valley is a region will be like the third terrace of Mendoza. So I told you, you have the east from 600 to 700 meters of elevation. Luján de Cuyo uh, where the, is where we have uh, the winery and the vineyard for, for the 1969. Uh, that will be the second terrace. The second terrace go from 900 to 1100 meters of elevation. And then you go to Uco Valley there is the third terrace that goes from, from 1,000 meters of elevation until 16 or, uh, 15 or 1,600 meters of elevation. So that's, there is getting colder. Um, the 1100 is, a, is located in, in the south part of this region. That is um, it, it's, it's on the south part of an alluvial fan, so it's facing a little bit south, and it makes it, keep, makes it more cold during the night. So this vineyard in particular, that we call Los Indios, has the highest diurnal swing in temperature. So it has, it's quite warm during the day, but the, night, the nights are quite cold. And the sun, with the soil, we have different conditions. We have some areas with stony soil, some areas with a deeper soil. But for making the 1100, what we use, it's a place that uh, has calcium carbonate, not very deep. It's about uh, 60, 70 centimeters deep. And this layer of calcium carbonate is so, so compact, so thick that the root cannot go through it. So the plants need to, um, they need to survive in the first 60 centimeters of the soil. So this, this creates a combination of two factors. In one side, you have the water, the water restriction uh, that is due because the soil is quite shallow. And the second, second factor that is when you have calcium carbonate in the soil, the plant uh, 
goes through a process of nutrient restriction. So you will have a nutrient stress, nutritional stress during the season. Just because the high concentration of, of calcare or calcium carbonate determines that some nutrients like zinc and magnesium are uh, less um, available for the plant. Yes? Yeah. So when you have a lot of calcium, the plants have problems to get the magnesium. So the, these plants are less vigorous. You know, the, mag, the magnesium is very important for the plant because it's the, it's the core uh, um, atom for, for the chlorophyll molecule. So this plant will have less vigor. It will be less productive. And the grape will, be, will have a, like more full ripening process which is very important in this cold area. So the wine in this occasion is, um, well, here we, we are playing with different varieties. The, the blend is based on Malbec, but the Malbec in this region, as well as the Syrah that are in the blend, are a little bit more spicy and they are uh, more uh, meaty, yes? Okay. They, they have, have a different profile you, you can find uh, more flower notes also. And for me, that's due to the, to these colder nights uh, and a lot of red fruit. So red fruit, spicy notes, some herbal notes, some meatiness. All this, it's a quite, I would say it's quite complex, uh, but expressive at the same time, uh, notes. And in the mouth, um, this place you have this very fine and delicate tannin structure. This blend, the 1350, has Cabernet Franc, 50, 55%, depending on the year. Uh, it has 40% of Malbec, and a little bit of a variety that we decided to, to plant there that is called Casavecchia. That is an Italian variety, not very unknown variety from Campania in Italy. Uh, that it has very exotic flavors and we, we decided to try it there. And we always put a little bit of that variety in the blend, about 5%. But the, the soul of this wine is the Cabernet Franc. So the wine is, is, uh, is, has a lot of flavors that are very complex because at the beginning you, you can feel the power of the Cabernet Franc, uh, that you feel, the, you feel these flavors of... Um, herbal notes combined mm. with a little bit of uh, green, uh, no, not the green, uh, yellow chili pepper. That is this kind of flavor and uh, some, some red fruit that sometimes maybe, um, how do you call it in English? Strawberry sometimes, but it's very subtle. That's from Cabernet Franc. And then uh, the Malbec adds the black fruit and add some some spiciness more to the to the side of I wouldn't say spi spiciness but herbal notes to the side of the um, rosemary and thyme that kind kind of herbal notes. So uh, well, it, it's everything is very quite complex because while you're going higher, not only the climate change but also you're getting closer to the Andes. So the kind of deposits that are there are different from the more flat area. Yeah, it's the, the hundreds and hundreds of little details. It's not just one thing changes, it's everything changes and yeah. how that affects, uh, you know, what, what grows yeah. and what style of wine is made. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Well, thank it's you been a pleasure, Jim. No, have a great evening. We'll see speak you to you next. soon. Cheers. Bye. Bye bye. Well, welcome back. And I hope that gave you a little bit of an insight um, as to what we had to learn for this tasting. We came in <laughs> thinking we were going to do high altitude Argentinian wines, thinking that mm -hmm. altitude was going to be the main and possibly the only factor that mattered. It's, it's really interesting because when you have a lot of wines presented to you, so uh, the other hat that we wear is we run a, run a little independent wine merchant and because we don't do enough things with the rest of our time, but 
um, we get representatives of Argentinian wine companies coming in saying this one is best because it's it's at 2,000 meters high. This one's best because it's 3,000 meters high from that world's highest vineyard. How um, many Godzillas is that? I have no idea, but. Um, <laughs> no, you're Godzillas. Man. No, you know you're Godzillas. It's a much more sensible unit. I think we can all agree on that. But um, when we started talking to the people who grow it, they're like saying, "Well, do you know what? It's a useful sort of marketing thing, and it does have a huge impact because the the bit that we I, I said roughly was that you'll get more ultraviolet light because there's less atmosphere. There's just less air blocking that ultraviolet light. So, plus there's no clouds, so you're getting incredibly intense light, and that forces particularly the red grapes, to thicken up their skins and develop those phenols. Um, but there's so many other little things going on. Because you, you, you know, when you look at a mountain, you see where the trees grow. You suddenly see where it all gets a bit scrawly and it's gravelly. And then you, you, as it goes steeper, it's much more solid rock. So well, it turns out that that's what they think is just this whole combination of things. No, absolutely. And, you know, with, with Donna Paola, we talk about the, the pits that they've dug and, yeah. you know, there's, there's so, there's so, so much more information. We could have just talked literally about holes in the ground for this entire tasting and the next week. I'm quite but, glad that we didn't. Though, but he was, he was, he was telling me like, he'd get into this like two meter deep hole and he'd be looking at the soil on one side and kind of like, this is this. And he'd turn around and <laughs> so completely good. different the other side. And you know, but if they keep up the digging at this rate, there's not going to be any vineyard left. <laughs> no part, nowhere to put your vines. <laughs> absolutely. But if if you like this real kind of in depth geeky stuff, yeah. do go to the Donna Paola website. They've got oh, they've got a three D video where you can literally get in a hole <laughs> and look around. No lie, it, it's one of the most incredible wine um, winery videos out there to really get the depth as yeah. to what matters. Um, it's it's beautiful. There's great videos, but it's not just pretty pictures of vines. You can really get into the depth of of why it is and why each wine is different as you go up the slope. So it's not only the altitude; it's it's the grape selection, it's the soil type, and there's and, and the grape selection is be partly because different things grow right. well at the different heights. So like even where the Bernard is higher than you know, and so that's that the Petit Verdot, wasn't it? So, but what's yeah. what's your take on these three? What 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 how? How do you think the sort of the different influences are sort of weighing out as a sommelier? So I think what's what's great about these wines is you have a lot of wineries who will make mm -hmm. three different wines to have three different labels as such. Yeah. And you could just have one of them and go, you know, that that's what they make. These wines each have their own character, their own reason, do. and their own place. Yeah. Um, you know, and you guys are gonna vote for your favourites at a point, and I'm I'm not going to tell you what my favourite is now because you might all pick something else because you <laughs> never agree with me. <laughs> and Alex can tell you a favourite and you'll all go with him. So whatever. Thanks very much. Love you all dearly. But anyway, these, <laughs> these wines... Sorry. I got, Stick to topic. Yeah, anyway, I'm going to bitter little... No, no not me. Um, I definitely didn't beat Tim yes, on the French yes, competition yes. earlier this week. Bitter, tannic, who bitter, knows tannic. me. Yeah. My new anyway, anyway back, back, to, back to normality. The three different wines, so they, they all have their different place. So, for example, if I just wanted to drink a glass of wine, mm -hmm. I would probably go for the 969 because yeah. it's a little bit richer, a little bit lighter, easier drinking. And we had completely different views on this at first. Uh, and it was really strange that, uh, you know, everyone talks about how a wine evolves as, as, as you leave it for a while. But I think this is perhaps one of the biggest wines where when I left it for a while and then came back to it after the others. I got world. a totally different impression of it, and my first impressions weren't brilliant. Then I went back to it. No, it's really like that. So yeah, really interesting. But absolutely. Then you go to the other end of the altitudes. I think this is the brightest, freshest, most elegant style. So yeah. if I was going to pair this with food, this is probably my food pairing wine. Mm. If I was going to have that Argentinian steak. Oh. Um, but then if I was right <clears> down the middle, and I'm like, oh, you know, this one in the middle. I think is that dinner party wine, and I wish we could all have dinner parties, but it's a little bit different now. But this is the wine. This is the closest thing. This, isn't this it? is the wine that if you're going to someone's house or you're doing mm. a gift, this is the one that you put down because it's it's light enough that if someone likes something light, great. If someone wants something heavy, it's it's not too far away from anything else. So for me, if I was talking about food pairings, mm. you know, this is kind of maybe a beefy thing, but this I would say doesn't particularly go with anything but would go very well with Alexis, everything yeah so but this, actually if you this want is to your hear most what, versatile one it is it's incredibly versatile and um donna paula have on their website as well as 
millions of virtual reality visits into the holes in the ground, they have a recipe, which um, is a really cool looking recipe. And I, I, I want to try it at home with this wine because it's basically... Are you it's not doing like it a, live tonight? Oh, I'll go and get the cooker out. No. Um, um, Disappointed. I'm far too tired for that. But yeah, the middle, the middle wine, um, they recommend it with basically what is like the Argentinian equivalent of a beef wellington. Absolutely. And so yeah, beef fillet, empanada dough, chimichurri, oh, happy days. So cool. That, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I, 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 I want to go back home and eat that right now. But um, yeah, the, the, so if anyone wants to come in and cook that for us, we will open the bottle of wine. You come and cook that for us. You're welcome to the studio any any time, any time. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. You're welcome. But yeah, um, I, 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 I hope that you're getting a nice impression of these these really quite different wines and the different expressions of different places and you know, different, different ideas, and different styles. And that and that the winemaker wants to do. It's nice to see that it's not just yeah Malbec. Caroline has some questions for us. Well, actually, you have some questions for us that Caroline has very helpfully filtered. So, just on the food, Liz says that she thinks wine number five is quail and black sheep. Okay, oh, please, yeah. please, please bring it in yep. and we will be the judge of that. Cool, cool on the fruit. I like that. That's that the new nice, standard. Nice please bring it in there. and we'll be the judge. Yep. But no, I think that would be great. Yeah. Um, question from Nathan. Which of the three reds is most like a power? Ooh, good question. Oh, so, that is a mm. very good question. So, because Kyle wines are pretty, pretty um, special and different because they are Malbec, aren't they? Yes. And, um, but Malbec. So, Kyle's a place Cla in clarification South from the winemaker. It, it, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it somewhere near the longer dog? <laughs> it's so yeah, absolutely. So, so Southern Frock, but Cahor makes Malbec, but it is not like Argentinian Malbec. No. It is not like so Bordeaux makes Malbec, so there's a, mm. it's a blending grape in uh, in Bordeaux as well. So Cahors for me is very thick, heavy, tannic, chewy, spicy. Argentina, a little bit warmer, a little bit riper, a little bit yeah. softer. So the one that is probably most like the Cahors is, I would say, the 1100, just because mm. it's got the most Malbec it's in it and it's got the Cab Franc, so it's got yeah. that French grippiness yeah. to it. But if you like a Cahor, I probably wouldn't substitute any of these wines in its place. Like, if you want yeah. a Cahor, drink a Cahor. Those are big boys. They, they, yeah. And, and I, I don't mean that in any kind of sex. They, they, uh, they need something to cut through. They, they, they benefit from a bit of age. And they bit need of age, something to... bit of air, bit of food. Because yeah. they good air. If you if you have a young, it's just it's so tannic, it's chewy. It's... So what 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 are the things that would work from a uh, and, and like not just what would you pair it with? What what are the sort of the things in food that you would want to do to, to help work with that sort of tannic wine you you need to have you need to have acidity mm -hmm. and you pro you with something like that you want to have a full flavored food a strong yeah. flavored food because if you've got something like it will just get left yeah. behind um something that's got a little bit of fattiness yeah. would be good so fat acid and full flavors are your friends with big strong wines that's even a bit of salt as well with that one. salinity yeah, yeah absolutely something to because salinity uh, is a, a flavor enhancer so once again heavy flavor you add a bit more salt you're going to get more yeah. flavor come out but yeah fattiness acidity and full flavor is going to be your yeah. friend with these bigger styles of wine cool and um, there's a question for the winemaker okay so i'm going out back to testing the grape yeah. acidity um how often do you test grapes around harvest time? Is it daily? Is it hourly? So it's only not hourly. Um, you might be doing it um, as they're sort of as you're slightly further away from your target. So you'll have a target for the level of ripeness and, and sugars and uh, the, uh, both on the acidity levels and, and on the sugar levels. And they'll be you'll watch them. You plot them on a graph. You might be doing it every couple of days. You might be doing it every week apart when you're there's still some way off it. But the closer you get to it you have to increase the rate of testing because suddenly it can overshoot incredibly quickly. And from the time where you make your decision, we've got to go and pick that field. You've got practical things in the way, like is the press free? Uh, what, what, what Are your pickers able to go and do that or do they have to be doing something else? So so yeah, it's 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 about a sort of a daily daily rate as you get towards that picking point. Does it, um, this is just purely me, um, does it change <clears throat> Does it become more often in places that have, you know, wilder weather that, you know, if you've got storms and rains coming in, you change? There's you definitely a predictability element to it. Okay. If, if you've got some the same sort of weather you're seeing every harvest, then you know it will probably go along the same curve as normal. But, but yeah, if, but if, if, if something... Nino comes in. Well, Nino comes in, or if the 
the, the rainstorms from last year in England come in, yeah, you, you'll just get out there and you, you just keep going and you're going, oh, what do I do now? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's, I hope not, that helps. Not all plane sailing. Not all plane Lots sailing. Lots of adaptability no. and there's not... And there's not and much I, you can do to fix I, it. I, and I've learned that going out with you this year. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not, this is your perfect thing. It's you go yeah. and you, you've got to adapt and you've got to make the best of what you have in the situation. And... A, no, a guy it was a lot of fun. A winemaker, uh, sorry, a winemaker and great grower said to me, um, "You can sit there looking at all these hypothetical figures, but unless you have a professional team who you're paying day in day out, a lot of vineyards in this country rely on volunteers to go off and help with that. And um, uh, if if that's the case, you've got to pick when the volunteers are going to come and do it for you, because otherwise, the grapes don't get picked. <laughs> Absolutely. On that note, is the spring wine? So the whites from uh, last year are ready and we are selling them by the tap because we didn't make very much of them because actually at the time we didn't have a winery. It was it was done mostly with our equipment, but in my garage while we were waiting to... I wanted to call it white burgundy. He was having nothing to do with that though. But yeah, so we've got we've got two different whites available. The reds, we, we just need to do a little bit more winemaking on. Reds normally take a, a lot longer than whites. Like you don't, you don't generally, apart from our friend... Uh, um, in, uh, in the Toddington services on the M1, you don't normally age um, a lot of English whites for a very long time. But, and, and a lot of, most whites are generally sort of done quite, quite young. And fresh. Definitely. Um, but the reds, they develop more from, because of the tannins, they, they just need a little bit more time for those tannins to come together from short chains uh, into longer chains, which are smoother. And that needs a little bit of air and it needs a little bit of time. And so that's, we, we've we still not quite there with the reds from, from last year. We have made a little bit more white this year and we picked the grapes ourselves, which was interesting because, uh, yeah. You don't realise how much effort goes into <laughs> hand harvesting until you hand harvest yourself. Yeah. Give me a tractor any day of the week. Yeah. and, and uh, But yeah. it was fun. It we'll was talk, We'll fun. talk about um, mechanical versus hand harvesting another day because it's, it's quite actually quite... There's some quite cool videos of these amazing machines working that I'm sure that my, my, my five-year-old daughter would love to watch. And actually probably my two-year-old son because he loves tractors. So. But anyway, we're yeah. talking. Should we're we talking. Ask should we ask people's opinions? Is it, is yeah. it opinion time? I think it might be opinion time. That's Please a great say that you idea. liked my favourite wine. I don't. So, what is your favourite wine? Um, Not telling me. No, whichever one comes top of the pole, obviously. <laughs> uh, that was my one. Oh, well, <laughs> it can't be. We can't both have the same favourite, can we? So yeah, we're, we're going to ask you what's what's your favourite of the three altitudes and what's your favourite wine of the night and also did you have a good time? Which I hope, I really hope that you have had. No, absolutely. And as as the um you know as this poll runs through, I just want to say thank you to everyone who yeah, supported. Us. We're so we're we're month one of changing from little bottles to this new packaging, and we're we're really excited where we are yeah. and. We just want to get better and give you the content that you want and the information that you want. So feedback is really helpful. Yeah, please see. Um, you know, if Alex bores you, Caroline says she's happy to host any time. <laughs> so if you'd like Caroline to host, just pop a, a comment in the chat. That's great. The more comments, Sounds good. the more yep. And yeah. Winner over. <laughs> exactly. So that's yeah. that's fun. So um, <laughs> She's cringing right we'll now. We'll give a couple of seconds to get the poll in. Continue enjoying yeah. your wines. Any more questions? Because if we don't have questions, we're going to sit here. And I think the other thing to say is as well, this is, this, is, this, is our, this is your club. So if you there's something if that you, you like found that's really cool. On your biscuit. If you like no, okay. <laughs> but yeah, look, if you've got a great idea for a tasting, you go, yeah, you guys have got to do this. You you've never been to the outskirts of uh, uh, the capital city of Moldova and you have to try their wines, they're amazing. Drop us a note and and let us know. We're 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 always interested to And hear. if we can find them, we source them and they're good and they're exciting and yeah. we feel we should share them with everybody, we absolutely will. So yeah, absolutely. Have we got some results? Well, we've got we got another question. Okay, oh, cool. Um, we've been asked where our vineyard is, boys. So we don't own a vineyard. Yeah. So we get grapes from wherever, uh, from wherever we think is is a particularly interesting opportunity to work with that year. So and we've got opportunities in England. Lots of lots of people don't make wine themselves. They just grow grapes, just like you were saying about, uh, you know, about about in Napa Valley. And over here, there's. There's there's loads of people who've just got a few acres of, of grapes planted, like like our friend Jeff, and um, um, so he was on the phone to us asking if we want to do some work with his grapes. Um, we've got uh, we got our grapes this year from a vineyard that's literally two miles from my house, and um, uh, so that that was that's local wine. But then last year was Puglia last from year southern was Italy. From Italy. 
So it's the idea of we, we are able to find great grapes that yeah. we can make fun wines with that we hope will offer good value for money that you come in and go, that's delicious. And for the price, it's a little bit of fun. Yeah. Um, and pre, pre-COVID, we actually had an offer of some, some grapes from Burgundy. And that would have been, let's just do a little barrel of something and just see what, what our take on a Burgundy is doing something a bit different. So, but um, exactly. yeah. The, the world's your oyster, and there's a lot of wineries around the world who operate like this and who don't have their own vineyards. There are advantages to owning your own vineyard because you control how the grapes are grown and you can control um, when the grapes are picked. So for a lot of the ones that we work with, the growers pick when they want to. So we tend to get wines that are a little bit less ripe. So our Malvasia is about 11% alcohol. But nice and zippy. It's zippy, it's cool, it's a really nice wine. But anyway, before we jump into the polls, we talk about what we're doing next month or the month after or the month yeah, after or the month sure. after because it's it's coming up to oh, we're, we're, we're sort of planning our december um yeah absolutely so so next month and the wines have been selected so mm-hmm. i'm very excited i'm very excited with it we're going to do because for those of you who are new to us uh, we do two levels we have our discoverers level which is mm-hmm. kind of a tour of an area and then <laughs> adventures like today was a little bit more of a deep, deep dive, dive and he gets to get geeky about winemaking or whatever <laughs> he likes to do um, uh, you love but, it too. I, I, I do, but I've <laughs> got to pretend I don't. Um, but anyway, so next month, our Discovery Level, we're doing Southern Italy. So we've got some stuff from Sicily, from Puglia, some of the little warmer regions, some fun yeah. stuff in there. And, and great for, value for money as well. Absolutely. And for our Adventurers Level, we're doing island wines. Mm. So um, mm. we're going to Cyprus. We're going to Santorini. I don't think we're going to the Isle of Wight. No, but uh, who knows where I we're going? I think there's a vineyard on there now. There definitely is. Yeah. There definitely is. <laughs> um, but we're going to do island wines, and then going into December, our discoverers level, we're going to do Portugal. We're going to have a white port and a red port, like bookending it, and then uh, some still wines, a white and a couple of reds. And I think what is my favourite thing that I've been putting together so far for the online wine it's tasting club, about this. we're doing a Rhone Rangers evening. So obviously the Rhone Valley is southern France, the home of Chateau Neuf de Pape, but that's blended grapes. So we're going to take a tour of the world and try the single varietals that make up that. And we're going to finish with our, our friend Florent at uh, Domaine de la Solitude and taste his Chateau Neuf de Pape to see how these different grapes affect the final blend. And so if you can taste them all in isolation and just really take a bit of time just to think, okay, what's that bringing to this? And then you, you get the assembled wine and you say, oh, I see that bit from there. And you can start to recognise it because you've just tried it. And that's one of the things about, about the Online Wine Tasting Club is that because we're doing five wines, there's, there's plenty of people who will send you a couple of bottles for 50 quid and talk you through it on Zoom. Um, but because you're trying five different wines, we can do some really quite cool things like that. And I... I, I I think Jamie has this ridiculous memory where he can just remember any great any wine that he's tried and just go, yeah, that's obviously that. And um, uh, I find it a bit harder, but when I've got them in front of me, I can do that. So uh, that'll be a really cool night. But anyway. And it, we're going to do a Christmas special as well. We'll do a Christmas think. special as well. Maybe. Why yeah. not? <laughs> Caroline's going to produce all these things for us because she's wonderful and then she host wonderful. them. And anyway, have we got some poll results? Do we do we know what people yeah. like? Oh. Can I squeeze in one? Yeah, we can squeeze okay. another question. Sure. Um, there's been a, a question about the chemical in coriander. What's it called? Oh my know? god! <laughs> Could I tell you? There's, I've got a really, really good um, source for that, and it's not me. And unfortunately, it would be my friend Google. I, <laughs> I, I, I would say, like, and truly, on on anything like this, you know, there's going to be questions come up. If I don't know the answer, I'm not going to feed somebody a line because. It's got to be there. Um, there are some chemicals we, that we all, okay, as wine we, people, know. We will find it out, and <laughs> when we send out the email um, for the for the tasting, because yeah. we've got the live video. If you want to share, the, well, it's not live anymore because it's pre-recorded once it's done. Um, but the video will come out, and I will find that information and we'll chuck it in the email so you know yeah. what it is. Uh, so sorry, I can't help we'd, you. We'd right rather now. give you the right answer than than the, an answer that we've slightly misremembered. You go, oh, you've put the. That's oh, I like that. He that says slightly misremembered. I would have said guessed. Um, <laughs> but anyway, let's have a little look at the wine of the night. If the poll, poll's ready, yeah. what's your favourite? He's going to pick now. Oh, God. Go, uh, go. You've not got long. Go. Uh, uh, so I think for me from? it's 1350, but oh, it's only well, just. You, you lose. 1100. <laughs> 1100 won. Oh, he's won. For once. For altitude. Okay. Oh. Was it wine number one? The wine of the night. 
Wow. How about that? The cheapest wine of the night. So that's impressive. And, and, and that is a cracking value wine because that's, that's just a shade over. Because everyone wants to get involved with the Piatelli Wine Club. <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. Oh, God. But, and 100% of people had a Oh, fantastic. That's Glad fantastic. To that. That's, that's, that's to good to that. hear. But yeah, dive on. Please yeah. tell your friends about us because the more people on, the more fun wines the more we can fun, get, yeah. the more winemakers who will talk to us. Because when I say, if I turn around and say, oh, I've got one person who drinks this wine, can you do this? Yeah. If we have a, you know, the more people we get, the more we can dive in and get more exciting winemakers and more exciting wines and get people into the studio and just make yeah. better content for you guys. Um, Godzilla's. Godzilla's. Oh, Godzilla's. How many Godzilla's? Ooh. Oh, Godzilla's. I loved putting together that Godzilla clip at the beginning. Well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, so I'm very disappointed videos. that there were so many wrong answers because I would have just thought people would know they're Godzilla's. But <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so the answer is a mere 15 Godzilla's. Um, 15. And that's that's quite shocking when we actually calculate it. That was a bit of a surprise. Godzilla's pretty big. It's a big Godzilla. I thought it would be a lot more Godzilla's. But it's not. 15. So how, what have we got? Have we I got? Think we had three winners. Three? So um, if you guys message each other and decide who's the winner, that would be great. No, we'll <laughs> give it to everybody. Yeah, so absolutely. if you can, because we love you dearly, if you can pop an email to um, info at onlinewinetasting.club and say, hi, it was me. I know about my Godzillas because we love you dearly. We can't but, even see the screen, so. But some, <laughs> some, sometimes uh, an email after a night like this slips through. So chuck us an email, remind us you won, and then we can uh, work out the next tasting you yeah. book in on. Let us know, and we'll get a, a friend involved with you. Um, I think the other thing, just to mention quickly, is that we're starting to get quite booked up now. We've got, we've done uh, already. Quite a lot of people have realised that th there's not that many things you can do for corporate Christmas parties or for school fundraising activities and. And oh, well, why not that? So so we do these things. Um, the easiest thing to do is to just have a chat with us, um, pick up the phone or drop us an email, and we'll uh, drop us an email is probably the easiest thing. Drop us an email. Say who, how many people you think would be wanting what you'd like to do, and um, and how much wine you how need. How much wine you need. Perfect. And, um, yeah, we we can we can we can certainly put something together, and it's a lot more interesting than just sitting uh, on Zoom listening to the CEO lecturing you about corporate strategy and. Uh, uh, that's what marketing I get, targets that's what I get for the next in. year. <laughs> Have we got marketing targets? No. No. Okay. More drink more wine. Caroline says yes. Caroline says yes. Yes, producer. Anyway, um Thank you so much. We've had a lovely night drinking some really cool wines and uh hopefully you guys have learned a bit about it. Um some nice dinner party stories so that when you pick up one of these bottles, all of the wines will be available on our shop afterwards. Hopefully Zoom will redirect you to the shop if I've done my <laughs> my IT work. If you've done that right, but if not, it's online wine tasting dot club where you get your tickets from. But we're yabbering, so I think it's time yeah. to say, roll, roll credits. credits.